Uh, hi there, I'm Dr. AJ Kumar, PhD. We're now reading Art and Algebra, uh, section 2.3, which is subgroups of the additive group of integers. Um, so, uh, uh, let me check. So there will be a link to buy the book down below, as there always is. Go buy the book and let's see. How long is this? Uh, three pages, okay. I'm looking in the table of contents. All right. Um, so we review some elementary number theory here, okay, in terms of subgroups of the additive group. And there's some more CIA notation, Z plus of integers. Okay, and I'm going to try zooming in, and then I'll, I'll see if I can just put up with it. To begin, we list the axioms for a subgroup when additive notation is used in the group. A subset S of a group G with a law of composition written additively is a subgroup if it has these properties. Closure. If A and B are an S, then A plus B is an S. Zero is an S, which is the identity. Inverses. If A is an S, then minus A is an S. Let A be an integer different from zero. We denote the subset of Z that contains all multiples of A by ZA. Right which is ZA is a set of N and Z where N is equal to K times A for some K and Z. Z. So in, uh, in other words, all so like Z2 is all of the even numbers, Z3 is all the um, integers divisible by 3, right? This is a subgroup of Z plus. Its elements can also be described as the integers divisible by A. All right. Theorem 2.3.3. Let S be a subgroup of the additive group Z plus. Either S is the sub trivial subgroup 0, or else it has the form ZA, where A is the smallest positive integer in S. Proof. Let S be a subgroup of Z plus. Then 0 is an S, right? And if 0 is the only element of S, then S is the trivial subgroup. So that case is settled. Otherwise, if S contains an integer n different from 0, and either n or minus n is positive, okay, otherwise, okay, the third property of a subgroup tells us that minus n is in S, so in either case, S contains a positive integer. We must show that S is equal to Z out, ZA when A is the smallest positive integer in S. We first show that ZA is a subset of S, in other words. So this is a typical way. Okay, let's. Uh, this is a good time to review some WF algebra. Let me blow it up all the way, and let's go over to my paint. Fuck off. Okay, so let, let's let's just read this, and then we'll and then I'll explain. I think I know where he's going with this proof. I haven't read this though. We first show that ZA is a subset of S. In other words, KA is an S for every integer K. If K is a positive integer, then K is A plus itself K times. Since A is an S, closure and induction show that KA is an S. Okay. Since inverses are an S, minus KA is an S. Finally, okay. Finally, zero equals zero A is an S. Next, next, we show that S is a subset of ZA. That is, every element N of S is an integer multiple of A. We, okay. Let me just, we use division with remainder. Let me, we use division with remainder to write N is equal to QA plus R, where Q and R are integers, and where the remainder R is in the range 0 to A. Go watch uh, my GCD video if you want to see how this works. Since ZA is contained in S, QA is in S, and of course N is in S. Since S is a subgroup, R is equal to N minus QA is in S too. Now by our choice, A is the smallest positive integer in S, while the remainder is but strictly between 0 and A, the only choice for r is 0, so r is equal to 0, and n is a multiple of a. Right. Okay, that makes sense. 
Okay, um, okay, this theorem, this proof makes perfect sense to me. Um, what, I, what I wanted to mention was uh, we have this, in WF algebra, we had the, um, oh, over here, we had the uh, subset relationship. So this is, or the implies relationship. So I'm going to, let me draw a Venn diagram. So let me just first actually write, A is a subset of B, preci this is precisely when, let me switch to a different color, precisely when, X is in A implies X is in B. Okay, these the these two statements are equivalent. Okay, now what this means is that we're we're going to write one combinator for both of these. So, or, or another way to think about it is A is a subset of B if for all x and a, that x is also in b. So let me, let me just draw a diagram, draw a better diagram. So here we have a, and here we have b, and in this case a is a subset of b. But if we have, let's say, We have something like this. This is A and this is B. Then A is not a subset of B. Okay. So as a truth table, we write this as, and then for the superset relationship, you obviously just invert it. But for as a truth table, let's write it as um, subset zero 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 one. One, zero, one, one, and let's draw our arrows. Okay, zero, zero. So if we're in the first, then we're in the second. Well, we're not in the first, so we're fine. So put a one here. Um, this is in fact true in every case. So if we're in the first, then we're in the second. That's true in this case. If we're in the first, then we're in the second. False in this case. If we're in the second, then we're in the first. Or if we're in the first, then we're in the second. True in this case. And then superset, you just flip the arguments. For superset, um, 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0. Um, and uh, one, one. One, zero. And if we cook up the poly number for this, it would be, okay, if you don't know what I'm talking about, go watch the WF Algebra series. Um, So it'd be one plus a. So this superset. Let me put this in a different color. This is one plus a times. So if this is a, this is b. One plus b, which is one plus a a b. That looks right. And then for superset, we should get we should get 1 plus b plus ab. So this would be 1 plus 1 plus b times a oh, nope. 1 plus a Uh, 
So this is equal to one plus, yeah, it's right, it's just the flip of the first one. Okay, and then the conjunction of these two, to take the conjunction or the and, you'd multiply them together. So let's do one plus b plus ab times one plus a plus ab. Okay, and then this will give us, I'm going to just write this in a third color. Okay, so we'll get 1 plus a plus ab plus b times 1 plus a plus ab plus ab times 1 And this is going to give us 1 plus a plus ab plus b plus ab. Anything times itself, you can rub off the exponents. Anything times itself is equal to 0 or is equal to 1 in z mod 2. Or anything times itself equals itself in z mod 2 plus uh, ab plus ab plus ab plus a b. Okay, so let's do some canceling. Uh, this cancels with this. Cancel. Cancel. Um, and then this should be 1 plus a plus b. And if we go and reverse engineer the truth table for this, um, this would be Let's call this IFF, or set eq actually would be better. So the set equivalence is both the subset and the superset relationship. I'm just illustrating this 0, 1, 0, uh, 1, 1. Um, this will give you 1 plus 0 plus 0. This is 1, 0, 0, 1. You can also tell because this is the 1 plus XOR, because A plus B is XOR AB. So it's going to give you the opposite of XOR. And look, this will be 1 when the arguments are the same, and 0 when they're different. In other words, um, this is saying that X is in A precisely when x is in b for all a and b. Okay? That's what this means. Okay. And so my point is is that if you're proving typically the way that you prove that it, that two sets are equivalent, let me save this as AA 23. Is that is that plausible? Is that where we are? Um, but the way you prove typically that two sets are equivalent is by um, is like like this. You prove one is a superset of the other, and so you, if you want to prove a and b are equivalent, a, a way to do it is to prove that a is a subset of b and b is a superset of a. Or no. a is a, both a subset and a superset of b. Then they're the same. Then they're the same set. Right. This is a proof that those two are equivalent. Um, so, my point was that that's, that's what this proof is. So, he shows ZA, so let me highlight this. Uh, we first show ZA, God damn it. God damn it. ZA is a subset of S. Okay. In other words, sorry, there's too much shit on my fucking desk. Okay. We first show that ZA is, you know, anyway, ZA is a subset of S. In other words, yeah, so first, ZA is a subset of S, and then later, he's going to show S is a subset of ZA.
and the idea is that this constitutes proof that ZA is equal to S, and he's constructed ZA in the definition of the theorem. ZA is, well, that, and A is the smallest positive integer of S, and then S is just some arbitrary subgroup, and we, can, we assume that we can find the smallest positive integer in A, and he's saying, well, just by the logic, the definition of subgroups, you can prove that it must be one of these things, so like Z3, you know, uh, Z2, oh, that, that's what we're doing right here. This is just the even number, 0, plus or minus 2, plus or minus 4, and then, you know, Z3, B, 0, um, plus or minus 3, plus or minus 6. So another, you can think of it as taking the integers and multiplying through by A. So ZA would be taking the integers and multiplying every single, taking the copy of the integers where you multiply everything by A. That could be a way to think about it. Anyway, <clears throat> um, okay, so, ah, go watch my GCD video for this. We're, we're down here where we are. Let me switch back to the pencil. Okay, and let's blow it up. There is a striking application of theorem 2.3.3 to subgroups that contain two integers. The set of all integer combinations RA plus SB of A and B is a sub... Ooh. So the set of all integer combinations RA plus SB of A and B, S is equal to ZA plus ZB, which is the set of n and z, such that n is ra plus sb for some integers r and s. So it's an integer linear combination, or an integer combination of a and b. Okay. It's called the subgroup generated by a and b, because it is the smallest subgroup that contains both a and b. Right, his idea is that this is going to be z of the gcd of a and b. Let's assume that a and b aren't both zero, so that s is not the trivial subgroup. Okay. This subgroup S has the form ZD for some positive integer D. It is the set of integers divisible by D. This generator D is called the greatest common divisor. Go watch my GCD video of A and B. I'll try to remember to link it for reasons that are explained in parts A and B of the next proposition. The greatest common divisor of A and B is sometimes denoted by GCD of AB. Proposition 2.3.5, let A and B be integers not both zero and let D be their greatest common divisor, the, inner, the positive integer that generates the subgroup S is equal to ZA plus ZB, so ZD is equal to ZA plus ZB. Then D divides both A and B, obviously. Any integer that divides both A and B also divides D. Right, any integer that divides two numbers also divides their greatest common divisor, right? Good. My GCD video will help clear a lot of this up because I explained it in much more basic terms, but yeah. There are integers r and s such that d is equal to ra plus sb. Proof. Part c restates the fact that d is an element of s, so, right? Next, a and b are elements of s, so, and s is equal to zd, so... D divides both A and B, right, okay. Finally, if an integer divides both A and B, right, then, then E must divide their greatest, com okay, yeah, that makes sense. The integer combination RA plus SB is equal to D, right. Note, if E divides A and B, then E divides any integer of the form ma plus nb. So c implies b, but b does not imply c. c 
C implies B. I, I don't I don't know exactly what what is included in C. So does C include the contact? Okay, I don't know. B does not imply C. So if an integer any integer that divides two numbers also divides their GCD, that does not imply that there that the GCD is an integer combination of any two of its numbers. Okay. Property C is a power... Okay. Anyway, I, that, I don't think this matters all that much. Well, it probably does, but... One can compute greatest common divisor easily by repeated division with remainder. Yeah, go watch my video on the Euclidean algorithm. Okay, I, do I really want to read this? Or just... Okay, fine. <sighs> One can compute a GCD easily by repeated division with remainder. For example, if A is 314 and B is 136, then 314 is 2 times 136 plus 42. 136 is 3 times 42 plus 10. 42 is 4 times 10 plus 2. And 10 is equal to 2 times 5. Okay. Using the first of these equations, Right, so go watch my Euclidean algorithm video. So th the answer is 2. Okay. If integers a and b are given, the second way to find their GCD is to factor each of them into prime integers and then to collect the common prime factors. I guess this is important, if he's saying it's important. Without theorem 2.3.3, .3, yeah, it would not be clear at all, you're right. Let's not discuss this, okay, we're not going to talk about it. Let's go back to it in chapter 12. What is chapter 12? Let me look. The book. Go buy the book. Factoring. Oh, yeah. Chapter 12 is factoring, so... Um, they're relatively prime if their GCD is 1. Okay, right. Um, oh, 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 corollary, right. Right, you can never get an integer linear combination below the G... Right, so this would imply... So, suppose... Suppose there are integers r and s such that ra plus sb equals 1. Well, by the logic we've just done, that would imply that their greatest common divisor is 1. And if they're relatively prime, by definition, that means their greatest common divisor is 1, and therefore, by our logic, ra plus sb is equal to 1. Okay. Corollary 2.3.7, let p be a prime. If p divides a product, then p divides a or P divides B. Let's think about it. Okay. Let's suppose that the prime P divides AB, but does not divide A. I think you need to prove unique factorization first. The only positive divisors of P are 1 and P. Since P does not divide A, the GCD is 1. Therefore, there are integers R and S such that RA plus SP is equal to 1. We multiply by B. Uh, this, is, this is kind of fishy. R and S such that RA plus SP... RAB plus SPB will be, and we note that P has to divide
yeah, I don't, I don't see that that logic doesn't really make sense. But let's just move on. <clears throat> I can believe that, but just factor the integers in to primes. But the, but um, yeah, I got to think about this. I'm gonna go look in a number theory textbook because I think a number theory textbook would iron out this argument a little bit better. Okay, there's another subgroup which is the intersection. Yeah, this is going to be the LCM, right? There's another subgroup of Z plus associated to a pair AB of integers, namely the intersection, which is the intersection. We assume now that neither A nor B is zero, and then ZA intersects ZB as a subgroup. It is not the trivial subgroup because it contains their product, which is not zero. So it, it's ZM for some positive integer M, which is the least common multiple and is sometimes denoted by LCM. Yeah. For reasons that are explained in the next proposition. Let A and B be integers different from zero and let M be their least common multiple. The positive integer that generates the subgroup S is equal to ZA intersect ZB. So the intersection of any two subgroups is always a subgroup, um, and the reason is because the group the group laws would apply to both, if that makes sense. So so work out that maybe it's going to be an exercise, but it's it's not hard to see. You know, G intersect H. Let's say those are both subgroups of some bigger group gamma. Well, the closure property will imply that the product of any two will be in both G and H. Um, inverses will be in both G and H, right? So, so ZM is equal to MA, ZA intersect ZB. Then, M is divisible by both A and B, okay? If an integer N is divisible by A and by B, then it is divisible by M. Both statements follow Okay, so M is in ZA, so it's divisible by A and also by B by the same logic. If it is divisible by both A and right, divisible by A and by B, then it is divisible by Okay, that makes sense. Right. Let D be the GCD and M, right? D times M is going to be A times B, right? Um, go watch my GCD video. Uh be the greatest common divisor and the least common multiple of a pair of positive integers, then a times b is d times m. Okay. I don't, this proof, since b divided by d is an integer, a divides ab divided by d, okay? Sure. Similarly, B divides AB divided by D. Ah, so both A and B divide this, so therefore M divides AB divided by D. So AB over DM is an integer. Okay, right, so he proves that if, if, if A divides B and B divides A, then A is equal to B. He doesn't prove that, but that's the that's the logic of this is if a divides b and b divides a then a is equal to b okay all right that's that's enough of 2.3 thank you for watching see you in the next video goodbye